Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Gaines Center's national webinar on Family Treatment Court Breast Practice Standards, Laying the Groundwork. Um, I am Dr. Melissa Stein, and I'm a Senior Research Associate at Policy Research Associates and uh, the Lead for Communications out of the Gaines Center. And I have just a couple of housekeeping remarks. First, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Throughout the presentations, we welcome you to uh, submit questions. On the right side of your computer screen, you should see a Q&A portal. Just click on that to expand it, and then you'll see a place where you can enter in questions throughout the presentation. So we will hold questions until the end, uh, and then we'll address as many questions as possible as time permits. You also should have just seen a poll pop up, and uh, we really appreciate you responding in these polls. We'll have um, this one here at the beginning and another at the conclusion of the webinar. And again, we really appreciate your participation. The webinar is being recorded, and uh, we will be disseminating the slides uh, both via the GAINS listserv as well as a direct email to all of you who have registered for this, e for this event uh, in a few days following the webinar. And at the conclusion of the webinar, we will provide a certificate of attendance uh, this is just for personal use, and uh, today uh, we are not able to offer CU credits for this webinar. Just a brief look at our agenda. We have some opening remarks from John Berg, who is a senior public advisor at SAMHSA. Then we'll have a presentation um, by two of our uh, partners at Center for Children and Family Futures. And then we will end with time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to John Berg for some opening remarks. John? Thank you, Dr. Stein. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar, Family Treatment Court Best Practices, or Best Practice Standards, Laying the Groundwork. We appreciate you taking the time out today to participate in uh, this informative webinar. Family treatment drug courts are an important resource for communities to assist families that have family members with substance use disorders that contribute to child maltreatment and become involved with child welfare agencies and the criminal justice system. SAMHSA is supportive of family treatment drug courts and provides funding for grants and training and technical assistance through SAMHSA's Gain Center to the field through webinars like this and other venues. In fact, um, our new FOA uh, was released this past week, a uh, week ago Friday actually, um, for treatment adult drug courts and family treatment drug courts. They're a combined FOA this year. Um, it's on the SAMHSA.gov website uh, under the Grants tab, and it is TI-20-003 if you're interested in looking at that. Um, Children and Family Futures partnered with NADCP to publish the Family Treatment Court Best Practice Standards with support by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. The best practice standards serve as an invaluable resource to family treatment courts, and the document benefits all treatment courts by providing guidance on how to best serve children and families involved in the justice system. SAMHSA is proud to have been a partner in the development and review of these standards. We appreciate our longstanding partnerships with OJJDP and with CFF that provides training and TA to our grantees and to family treatment drug courts across the country. I would also like to mention in the FOA that I referenced earlier that um, Appendix O lists um, the past guidelines. We are updating that, and so um, if you go today to look at the FOA, you might want to check back in the next day or two and see if those have been updated to these standards. Um, this is what we're going to ask um, you to um, refer to in your application would be the, the fiscal year 19 standards that we're going to present today. 
We know that the implementation and ongoing management of family treatment drug courts is complex and challenging, so we are pleased to provide this webinar today and hopefully support you in this difficult but rewarding work. Today's presenters will provide an overview of these recently released standards and how programs and courts can begin to implement them. We are pleased to have Dr. Shurston Frescon and Brooke O'Byrne of Children and Family Futures present on this very important topic, and I want to thank them for taking time today to share their expertise. I would also like to thank the Gaines Center and their staff for their work in developing and facil facilitating today's webinar. So at this time, I will turn it back to Dr. Stein. Thank you so much, John. And now I'm going to, going to take just a few minutes to introduce our presenters. So first we have Dr. Sherston Fuscom, who is a senior program associate with Children and Family Futures, where she supports the implementation of family treatment courts. And she has more than 25 years of experience developing, implementing, and evaluating community-based programs and policies. Uh, previously, she has served as the North Carolina Drug Treatment Court Manager, Senior Consultant for the National Drug Court Institute, Senior Research Associate with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Center for Uner uh, Urban and Regional Studies, and Maternal, Infant, and Child Home Visiting Coordinator with the North Carolina Division of Public Health, Children, and Youth. We also have Brooke O'Byrne, who is a Senior Program Associate at Children and Family Futures, and she serves on the change team for two prevention and family recovery initiative sites. Uh, she has served in uh, numerous previous positions, including Director of Court Services for Nevada's Sixth Judicial District Court and Board Chair of Nevada's Rural Behavioral Health Policy Board. She founded her community's first rural outpatient family-centered treatment facility and is a certified drug and alcohol counselor. And I just want to uh, note, uh, as we close our poll, so once, as our results pop up, I'll just um, remind you all that you can download the best practice standards on the Children and Family Futures website. The link is right there, www.cffutures.com org, and uh, you should find the best practice standards there on their um, web page. Uh, feel free to download that if you want to follow along as our presentations will walk you through the best practice standards. And as you see on the poll, uh, we have many of you joining from rural locations, which is really exciting. Welcome. Um, we also have a, a good number of people joining from suburban and urban locations. I, uh, not, not surprisingly, a majority of you are calling in from judiciary positions, um, but we also have a number of you joining from government, community-based service providers, and other uh, behavioral health and criminal justice agencies. So thank you all for joining us. Welcome. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Feskin to kick off our presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Today, we're really pleased to introduce you to the newly released Family Treatment Court Best Practice Standards. Um, the standards really mark a crucial step forward for the Family Treatment Court field. The eight standards provide clear practice mandates to improve outcomes for children, parents, and families affected by substance use or co-occurring disorders who are involved in the child welfare system. In 2016, a group of local practitioners, state treatment court coordinators, and national technical assistance providers met to discuss the state of family treatment courts in America. From these meetings, the National Strategic Plan for Family Drug Courts was developed and released in 2017. The strategic plan set out a broad vision that, quote, every family in the child welfare system affected by parental or caregiver substance use disorders will have timely access to comprehensive and coordinated screening, assessment, and service delivery for the family's success. The plan also outlined three critical goals for the field. First, to improve the effectiveness of the existing family treatment court network by assuring it operates with fidelity to the family treatment court model. 
Second, to expand the reach of family treatment courts to keep families together and reduce child mal maltreatment. And finally, to continue to build the evidence base about what works for family treatment courts to improve outcomes for children and their parents. The first strategy of the first goal was to develop model standards to guide the daily operations of family treatment courts. The family treatment court standards released in September 2019 represent our current knowledge base about evidence-based and promising practice in child welfare, dependency courts, substance use and mental health treatment, the support of child, parent, and family well-being, implementation and evaluation science, and more. We believe that when local practitioners implement the family treatment court standards with fidelity, outcomes for children, parents, and families and family treatment courts will improve. As local practitioners strive to develop the resources, partnerships, and best practices set out in the standards, we anticipate that all families involved in child welfare within that district will benefit and that the outcomes for these families not served by the family treatment court will also improve. Finally, the Family Treatment Court Best Practice Standards establish what communities need to improve practices and outcomes for vulnerable families. Local practitioners can use the best practice standards to argue for the resources needed to serve these families. And state, federal, and tribal policymakers can leverage the standards to establish policies and funding to support these practices. The standards are really a reflection of your work. You have developed the innovations, implemented the evidence-based practices, collected and evaluated the data to produce the eight standards. The standards reflect research and practice experience in, as we said, child welfare, dependency courts, substance use and mental health treatment, drug treatment courts, and other disciplines. An advisory group of 24 local and state practitioners, national technical assistance trainers, researchers, and federal funders worked together for over two years to identify best practices, draft the standards, and refine the final product. Although they're divided into eight standards that highlight different aspects of practice, Effective practice and desirable outcomes are dependent on implementation of all eight standards together. So as you engage with the standards, you will learn that although standard two, role of the judge, sets out the core practices for a family treatment court judge or magistrate, standards one, three, six, and seven also include direct practice roles for judges and magistrates. Likewise, Although standard five focuses on substance use disorder treatment, standards one, three, four, six, seven, and eight also speak to best practices for treatment providers. Today, we will introduce you to each of the eight standards and highlight one provision and its underlying research. Although some of the provisions reflect best practices for any complex community intervention, such as a treatment court, Today, we're going to largely focus on one provision and research that makes family treatment court practice unique. During the development of the standards, the advisory group spent quite a bit of time discussing what these collaborative community and court-based interventions should be called. There was unanimous agreement that they should be called family treatment courts rather than family drug courts. The group also agreed that although court stands out in the name, family treatment courts actually describe the entirety of the intervention and its partners. Child welfare, treatment, children's services, health, intervent health education, and dependency courts. This intervention depends on the effective collaboration and synergy of all of these systems. So throughout the standards, and when we say family treatment court, we are actually naming and describing the collaborative intervention and its partners as a whole. Um, as you were recommended as we started um, the, the webinar today, if you've not already done so, we really do encourage you to go to the Children and Family Futures or National Association of Drug Court Professionals website download and print a copy of the Family Treatment Court Best Practice Standards for your own use. 
Each standard is set up in the same way and permits the reader to, to browse the standards for a big picture overview of expectations or to go more deeply to understand the research base and practice experience that informed the development of each standard. If you or a partner just want to understand the big picture, we encourage you to read the executive summary that includes the summary paragraph for each standard and lists the provisions included in that standard. For greater depth, you should turn to the individual standard. Each standard begins with a summary paragraph that outlines expectations. Following the opening paragraph, each provision paragraph expands on the description, detailing what should be done. The provisions are written to be clear and measurable. As local jurisdictions revise their policies and procedures and as states move towards certification of family treatment courts, these provision paragraphs establish the actual practices expected to meet the standards. The rationale includes a description of the research used to develop the provision. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and the key considerations include details the advisory group believes to be important for understanding the research and practice. Finally, each standard includes a detailed list of the references cited. The best practice standards establish what to do. They don't actually tell you how to do it. The standards are already 200 pages long and they would have been much too long. So instead, we will be working with our partners at GAINS, SAMHSA, Juvenile Justice, NADCP, National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare, Child Welfare League of America, and others to link existing curricula and resources and to develop others to ensure you receive the implementation and evaluation support you need to effectively address each standard and every provision. As you approach the standards, it's important to keep in mind several things. First, if you're an operational family treatment court, you are already engaging in most of the practices set forth in the family treatment court best practice standards. The standards were drafted by family treatment court practitioners and researchers based on their experience in operational family treatment courts and with real communities in mind. Having said that, there may not be a family treatment court anywhere in this country that has fully implemented every provision in every standard. The best practice standards are just that, they're best practices. It was important to the advisory group that the standards reflect the best of what research and practice, practice tells us about how to effectively support and heal children, parents, and families involved in child welfare affected by substance use and co-occurring disorders. These are not minimum standards. They are best practice standards. So the last thing we would say is to be patient with yourselves and your partners. The best practice standards set the bar for best practices. With these goals in mind, you will all be better prepared to move forward and eventually achieve a version of these standards that makes sense in your community. During the balance of our time today, we're going to go through each of the eight standards. Before we dig into the details, however, we want to take a minute or two to talk about a way to think about approaching the standards. Standard one, organization and structure, forms the foundation for effective family treatment court practice. We urge you and your team to spend extra time reviewing the standard and working to address any areas of practice that don't fully meet the recommendations. Standards two through seven describe specific areas of practice. All family treatment courts engage in these six general practices. You and your team should work together to identify areas of particular strength and areas that require further development. Standard eight, to some extent like standard one, is fundamental to good practice. While the practices described in standard one establish the strong foundation from which you and your team can build a strong program, standard eight describes the practices necessary to know if you're doing well. The practices described in standard eight include the core data collection and continuous quality improvement activities 
that help you measure progress and understand if your family treatment court is making a difference in the lives of children, parents, and families. Standard one, the family treatment court has agreed upon structural and organizational principles that are supported by research and based on evidence-informed policies, programs, and practices. The core programmatic components, day-to-day -day operations, and oversight structures are defined and documented in the FTC Policy and Procedure Manual, Participant Handbook, and Memoranda of Understanding. So before we dig into the provisions in the next page, we want to remind everyone that you should have a Policy and Procedure Manual, Participant Handbook, and MOUs. Each of those documents should describe your team's actual practice and should be revisited and revised annually. I know there are lots of treatment courts out there that have created these documents many years ago because your funder required it and you may not have looked at it since. These should be really living documents. They're important for the sustainability and competent operation of your family treatment court. Um, if you have, it, if you need to, to access some examples of this, we suggest that the peer learning courts um, make, their, make their documents available to interested courts, which can be found on CFF's website. Standard one has a ton of critical information about how to establish a strong foundation for your treatment court. Although we're not going to address it today, we urge you to go back to the fundamentals and generate a meaningful shared vision and mission statement. These tell you, your team, your participants and community what you're doing and why. We know everyone hates to do them, but they're a key aspect of establishing the scaffolding on which you will build your entire family treatment court intervention. Also, you will not be able to effectively implement standards three through eight if you do not establish and nurture a strong governance structure. Your governance structure is the means through which you will problem solve and enhance your family treatment court practice. Thomas, we're going to focus today on provisions that are particular to family treatment court practice. We urge you to establish or revisit your family treatment court practice to make it more family-centered and child and parent focused. Your family treatment court should include all agencies that are integral to serving children, parents, and families involved in child welfare that have substance use or co-occurring disorders. Looking at this list, are all of these roles represented in your family treatment court? Do you have service providers who do developmental screening or home visiting? The health department or school system is part of your core or extended team? Does the team discuss children's needs and services, parenting time, and the parent's progress in treatment? Family treatment courts are, ch are a child welfare intervention, not a criminal one. Although some of your parents may have concurrent criminal cases, and you should consider whether it makes sense to include probation on your team if it's, a co if it's common in your jurisdiction that parents have concurrent criminal cases. The point is that your family treatment court should not look, sound, or act like an adult criminal treatment court that just happens to have a dependency court petition as the means of establishing jurisdiction over the case. It should be fundamentally focused on supporting family well-being, the safety of children, and the stable recovery of parents. The power of any treatment court is the team. The team is able to effectively address the comprehensive needs of parents, children, and families, and the team holds the parent and each other accountable to meeting those needs. Who is missing from your team? What services or supports do your parents, children, and families need that are not being addressed or would be more effectively addressed if that agency or role was represented in your multidisciplinary team or in your multi-level governance structure? Standard two, the role of the judge. The judge, magistrate, or referee is a critical member of the FTC team. Although the judge is often considered the team leader, leadership can emerge and be nurtured within any member of the team. The FTC judge does, however, perform a number of particular functions. 
With the role and title of judge comes a particular power to convene partners. Judges, this is one of your most important roles on the team. When a judge issues an invitation for a meeting, those invited generally participate. Your power to convene was seen as so important and integral to your role that the judges who drafted the standard made convening partners the first provision in standard two. Today, however, we're going to talk about provision C, participation in the family treatment court pre-court staffing. Some of you are thinking, of course the judge participates in the pre-court staffing. While others of you are thinking, our judge has never participated in the staffing. We're calling your attention to this provision because we know this is an area where there's diversity in practice. Research tells us that the relationship between the judge and the participant is one of the most significant aspects of the treatment court intervention. Study after study tells us that there is a difference in the relationship that develops between the judge and participants in a treatment court and the relationship between the judge and parent in regular dependency court. To be most effective, the judge hears updates from the team during the pre-court staffing and has the opportunity to ask clarifying questions. When the judge is part of the pre-court staffing, the team can empower the judge with specific discussion points to be used during the court interaction between the judge and the participant. If your judge is not part of your pre-court staffing, we encourage you to convene a meeting to discuss the barriers to her or his participation in the staffing. Is it a question of managing time? Are there concerns about ex parte communication? Family treatment court teams across the country have confronted and solved these same questions, and you can too. Standard three, ensuring equity and inclusion. Do you know the demographics, gender, age, race, and ethnicity of the parents and families who have a substantiated case of neglect or abuse in the jurisdiction your family treatment court serves? What are the demographics of substantiated cases that involve substance use or co-occurring disorders as an underlying cause for the neglect or abuse? The cases referred to your family treatment court and those that are admitted successfully complete and are reunified should reflect the demographics of the population with substantiated cases. The great, new, the great news about meeting the needs of a variety of populations is that the fundamentals are rooted in paying attention to your data, ensuring individuals and families access quality, culturally competent treatment, and that you engage in a process of continued learning. Each of these provisions is addressed in depth throughout the standard. Your team should examine your data at each point in the child welfare case to ensure that every parent and family has the opportunity to receive the services and, services and support needed to become healthy and whole. Is there proportional access for all demographic groups in the child welfare population to your FTC? Do you have quality treatment that meets the needs of moms and dads? Is treatment available at times and in locations that make it accessible to different populations? We know that a quality family treatment court intervention increases the likelihood of successful and stable recovery and reunification. All families in need of the comprehensive and intensive services and support should have an opportunity to be referred, admitted, and successfully complete the family treatment court. Standard four, early identification, screening, and assessment. Use of objective and valid screening and assessment tools increase the likelihood that participants will receive the level of care and services they need while not requiring participants to fail out of lower or higher levels of care than is appropriate or requiring participants to complete services that are not needed.
do you know what screening and assessment processes and tools are used by your family treatment court partners? Does your team have clear and objective eligibility and exclusion criteria? Does your team still vote to admit a participant? Do your parents all get the same case plan and are they required to adhere to the exact same requirements for successful participation in your treatment court? If you said yes, to either of these last questions about voting and case plans, you need to sit down with your team and steering committee to discuss and revise these practices. Does your team know what is on the child's case plan? Do you talk with parents about their children? Do the case plans include quality and frequent parenting time, otherwise known as visitation, and do parents and children participate in parent-child dyad services geared to the developmental and other needs of the child and parent? If you said no to any of these questions, you also need to talk with your team and steering committee about more ways to make your family treatment court and case plans more family-centered and inclusive of parent and child voice. tempting to want to exclude parents and families that you believe will struggle with the expectations of the court. We frequently hear team conversations that discuss whether they would be, quote, setting this family up to fail, unquote, because they don't have reliable transportation, live far from services, are homeless, or some other characteristic of the case. But some of these characteristics are simply associated with poverty. Research tells us that well-administered treatment courts are as effective and sometimes even more effective with challenging cases, those with co-occurring mental health diagnoses, young parents, and those that are homeless at the outset of the case. We challenge you to consider two things. If participating in a family treatment court has been shown to significantly increase the likelihood that a family will be reunified, that children will spend less time in out-of-home care, and that parents will achieve stable recovery. You cannot in good conscience refuse admittance to families because of characteristics that are often associated with poverty. Second, if you think the circumstances of a particular case are too complex to be managed in the family treatment court, where will they be managed instead? Generally, a treatment court is the most intensive and supportive intervention available. And with that, I will pass the mic over to my colleague, uh, Brooke O'Byrne. Brooke. Thank you, Shearston. So standard five speaks to high quality and timely treatment. When your team has early identification and screening practices in place, you can then provide parents with timely access to quality substance use disorder treatment that addresses the assessed needs of parents. Timely access to treatment, treatment means we can quickly engage and retain parents in the recommended treatment services. And when we offer timely access to care, we are able to be responsive to the timeline set by the Adoption and Safe Families Act, or ASPA, and the developmental needs of children. Quality treatment recognizes that substance use disorders are a chronic but treatable disease and offer a continuum of treatment services to meet individual needs of parents. Think about your family treatment court. Is treatment planning responsive to the ASPA timeline and the de developmental needs of children? Is the level of care parents receive specific to their assessed need, or does everyone receive the same level of treatment when they enter your program? Standard five requires us to address the complex needs of families served in our family treatment courts. One way to do this is by providing services in the context of the family's relationship, particularly that parent-child dyad. The continuum of services offered to parents needs to include early identification, screening, and brief intervention, comprehensive standardized assessment, stabilization, manualized evidence-based treatment, including medications, ongoing communication across the family treatment court team, and continuing care. 
The treatment plan needs to be provided in a timely manner. It should be based on individualized and assessed needs and assessed strengths and needs to include concurrent treatment of mental health and physical health needs. To ensure timely access to treatment, family treatment court team members need to collaborate, communicate, and share information across systems effectively to ensure families are properly assessed, referred, and successfully linked to the recommended treatment services. Faster access to treatment is associated with an increased likelihood of treatment retention. And the longer someone stays in treatment, the more likely they are to complete the treatment episode, and completion of a treatment episode is associated with a higher likelihood of successful reunification and child welfare case closure. This is just one piece of the research demonstrating the connection between treatment completion and reunification. A statewide longitudinal study of nearly 2,000 women with children placed in substitute care found that when women entered treatment more quickly, spent more time in treatment, or completed at least one treatment episode, their children spent fewer days in foster care and were more likely to be reunified with their parents. In a similar study, participants in a family treatment court that were provided immediate intensive substance use disorder treatment had significantly more reunifications. Their children had fewer placements and longer term foster care, and their children spent less time in non-kinship foster care than families that were not in the family treatment court. Think about your family treatment court. How long does it take for a parent to begin treatment? Is it a matter of days or can it take weeks to complete an assessment and actually begin a treatment service? Family treatment courts need to collect data that helps you determine how long it is taking parents, on average, to receive an assessment and to begin treatment. As you work toward improving your family treatment court practice, focus on reducing that time. And although you may begin by trying to reduce time for parents and families involved in the family treatment court, as you generate system improvements, you should also work to improve this process for all families involved in the child welfare system affected by substance use or co-occurring disorders. Some ideas for reducing the time to treatment are offering co-located substance use disorder treatment staff within the child welfare or the courts, dedicating a treatment liaison to participate in staffing and attend court sessions, simplifying your intake process to reduce the number of steps a parent or family has to go through to complete the intake, and making sure treatment is accessible by ensuring providers have office hours beyond nine to five. Standard 6 addresses comprehensive case management services and supports for families. The family treatment court model requires teams to look beyond screening, assessment, and treatment for parents. Family treatment courts serve the whole family, including children, and services should range from individual prevention services to family-based support services. Standard 6 provisions address the full array of support services. For today's purposes, there are too many services and supports addressed in the provisions to discuss on this webinar. However, we do want to highlight two, recovery support and high quality parenting time. We've selected these due to the effect that they have on child safety, permanency, and family well-being. Recovery supports promote treatment engagement and retention and sustained recovery because it links parents with professionally trained and in some cases certified recovery specialists. These professionals have knowledge based on their lived experience of substance use disorders and recovery plus formal training. Recovery supports begin providing services prior to or soon after a family enters the family treatment court and they continue to deliver services throughout the child welfare case process and after family treatment court discharge. High quality parenting time or visitation, and it, or visitation as it used to be called is a priority when children are placed out of the home. High quality parenting time is well resourced and face to face. Parenting time needs to have a therapeutic focus and be frequent enough to establish, maintain, and strengthen the parent-child relationship 
while also protecting the child's safety, addressing the child's developmental and physical needs, and working to achieve sustained permanency. So we've already heard that comprehensive screening is instrumental in identifying unique family needs and developing an individualized treatment plan. But what is important to note in the research is that when we look at, at a randomized control trial of nearly 3,500 parents, we see that a timely comprehensive assessment alone does not improve critical child welfare outcomes. Timely assessment is only associated with positive outcomes for families affected by substance use when it is paired with a specialized caseworker, similar to a recovery coach, focused on treatment access, treatment engagement, and treatment completion. The study focused on an intervention designed to improve reunification for foster children. The findings focus on the timing of the intervention, comprehensive screening, and access to treatment service in relation to temporary custody hearings. Findings suggest that early access to substance use services matters, but only when parents were connected with a recovery support system. I mentioned earlier that there is a strong correlation between reunification and substance use disorder treatment, retention, and completion. Completion of at least 90 days of treatment nearly doubles the likelihood of reunification, and parents who do not make progress in treatment and parent, parenting training are more likely to have their parental rights terminated, which is alarming because, as some of you may have experienced, many parents don't engage with the recommended treatment services. One study found that nearly 60% of parents in child abuse and neglect cases did not comply with treatment attendance conditions. This makes services to support early treatment engagement, retention, and completion a critical component of comprehensive case management services available through family treatment courts. Using trained and sometimes certified recovery specialists is a proven engagement and retention strategy. Recovery and peer support specialists work with parents, child welfare caseworkers, treatment agencies, and other members of the family treatment court team to remove barriers engage parents in treatment, and provide ongoing support to parents and families. In some instances, qualified peer support providers are an evidence-based model of care and a Medicaid billable service under specific conditions. The positive outcomes associated with, with recovery and peer support specialists for individuals with substance use disorders include reductions in rates of substance use, return to use, and emergency services. In addition, individuals with substance use disorders who receive recovery and peer support often experience improvements in treatment retention, relationships with treatment providers, housing stability, access to social supports, and satisfaction with treatment. Children need to spend time with their parents. A secure and stable parent-child attachment forms the foundation for a child's social, emotional, and cognitive development. The younger the child and the longer the period of uncertainty and separation from their primary caregiver, the greater the risk of harm to the child's health, development, and well-being. Infants and toddlers who do not develop secure attachments experience high levels of stress, which can affect brain development and cause long-term harm. And young children with unhealthy attachments have a much greater risk of delinquency, substance use, and depression later in life. Think about the parenting time offered through your family treatment court. How often do children have an opportunity to bond with their parents? For children separated from their siblings, how often do they have an opportunity to bond with their brothers and sisters? Children who have regular, frequent contact with their families are more likely to reunify and less likely to re-enter the foster care, re-enter foster care after reunification. When children are separated from their parents, it is important to provide parenting time as often as can safely occur. The recommendation is to hold the first parenting time visit within 48 hours of the initial placement. Currently, there isn't research detailing exact frequency and length of parenting time visits between parents and children or between siblings. But within the Family Treatment Court Best Practice Standards, um, there is a suggested 
a table with suggested frequencies and lengths of parenting time sessions for various age and developmental stages of children. And that's based on a body of research. Keep in mind the table is a guide. Teams really need to consider each child and family situation to determine the appropriate frequency, number, duration, and types of parenting and family visits. Also keep in mind that parenting time is a right of children. It is not appropriate to deny parenting time opportunities due to, po due to a positive drug screen. Changes to parenting time schedules should be made in response to safety concerns. Standard seven addresses behavior response, which is everybody's favorite topic. Um, in the family treatment court model, responses are addressed as therapeutic responses to behavior. The purpose for responses is to intervene therapeutically to engage families and to modify behavior. Teams need to consider the biopsychosocial complexities to support behavior change. And what that really means is that teams need to be talking about what is the cause of behavior? What services is the family engaged with? And how long have they been engaged? How will the response support engagement and treatment, support services, and the family treatment court? And how does the response promote successful case closure? In addition to the essential elements of behavior modification, therapeutic responses to behavior aim to enhance the likelihood that families can be unified be reunified before ASPA requires an alternative permanent plan for the child. Provisions within Standard 7 encourage teams to use responses that engage families. Therapeutic responses to behavior are more than a prescribed grid of incentives and sanctions. We have a toolbox of responses at our disposal, and that includes treatment adjustments, complementary service modifications, and incentives and sanctions. Treatment adjustments are based on the clinical needs of the parent's physical, social, or emotional health and include changes to the type of treatment, level of care, or dosage. When a parent does not meet treatment expectations, child welfare case plan goals, or family treatment court phase expectations, the clinical staff on the family treatment court team implement a treatment adjustment. Adjustments to treatment are not used as a sanction or incentive. They are a therapeutic response to behavior. An example can be found in a case where a parent is attending intensive outpatient services. Uh, that parent may, may spend a period of time engaging in services, then experience a relapse, followed by continued disengagement in the program or services. At this point, treatment professionals, professionals should reassess for the appropriate level of care. Does the parent need residential services or medically assisted treatment? Or is there something else going on? Teams can address structural barriers through complementary service modifications. Family treatment courts can overcome structural barriers such as housing, transportation, childcare, and individual barriers such as learning disabilities when deciding how to most effectively respond to participant behaviors using complementary service modifications. When determining what type of response is warranted, consider whether changes to the parent's case plan that are related to their structural or individual barriers are needed to further support engagement and success. So using the previous example of the parent who disengaged following a relapse, perhaps there is a change in their life that presents more structural barriers. Perhaps that parent lost their housing or have reconnected with an old friend who is not in recovery to address some of their transportation needs. Teams need to look at these challenges to provide supports and engage parents in treatment and support successful completion of the child welfare case plan. When behaviors do not support long-term recovery and successful closure of the child welfare case, ask why. Treatment adjustments and complementary service modifications are often the two most effective ways the family treatment court team can respond. Incentives and sanctions are the third tool in the toolbox. They require family treatment courts to have a range of responses of varying intensity. Teams can use these responses to enhance participant engagement and encourage behaviors that support sustained recovery, healthy family relationships, and long-term reunification. In family treatment court, 
the delivery of sanctions always considers the child's safety and well-being. If the children are living with the parent participating in the family treatment court, you need to consider how imposing a sanction will affect the children and their relationship with that parent. When considering possible responses, remember parenting time is a child's right. It is not a tool to reward or sanction a parent. Changes to frequency or supervision levels of parenting time are made in response to safety concerns and enacted to ensure the safety of children consistent with legal requirements. Responses to behavior must reinforce the child-parent-family relationship. All responses to behavior need to work to improve child, parent, and family safety, well-being, and permanency by reinforcing behaviors consistent with recovery, reunification, resolution of the child welfare case, and eliminating behaviors inconsistent with those goals. So one approach to addressing behaviors is to offer parent and child services that work to eliminate risky behaviors inconsistent with recovery and family safety. Family treatment courts that provide parenting and children's services have better child welfare and treatment outcomes than those that provide services targeted only to parental substance use disorder recovery. Family treatment courts that offered celebrating families and engaging moms, which are family-focused interventions that parents and children attend together, improved parenting capacity and increased participants' understanding of their substance use disorder. Families who participated in these programs also had fewer new maltreatment allegations. The last standard addresses monitoring and evaluation. Although we commonly address monitoring and evaluation last, it is a critical component of family treatment courts as Shearston mentioned earlier in this webinar. Data tells the story of how your family treatment court provides effective services worth sustaining in your community and helps your team engage in a process of continued quality improvement. Teams need to collect data to monitor family safety and well-being. Take a minute to think about what data points you collect. What information do you gather to demonstrate your family treatment court is improving the safety of children and well-being of families? It is really common for teams to focus on program completion and use graduation as a metric of success. Graduations are really fulfilling. They are a chance for us all to see a happy ending. The truth is, graduation rates tell us nothing about child safety or family well-being. The outcome measures family tre treatment courts need to monitor include permanency, so how many families successfully reunify or secure kin placements, how long does it take them to reach permanency? And how does that length of time compare to permanency outcomes for your community or state? We need to be collecting data about repeat maltreatment and reentry. How many of the children served through our family treatment courts experienced subsequent maltreatment or return to foster care? And as I mentioned earlier, we need to collect data about treatment. How quickly are families assessed and referred to treatment? How long does it take them to begin the recommended treatment? And how long do they stay? If your program isn't collecting any of this data, I'm sure it sounds incredibly overwhelming. It's okay to start small. What are the rates of reunifications for, what are the rates of reunification for families served through your family treatment court? And one year later, have those families come back? The provisions of Standard 8 address how data is stored and used. The best practice standards provide opportunities for all partners to examine their practices, both through the narrow lens of their own system and through the expanded lens of the larger, multidisciplinary, comprehensive, family-centered system of care that is the Family Treatment Court. Family Treatment Courts move through a process of planning into implementation and move into continuous quality improvement and monitoring adherence to the best practice standards. Monitoring and evaluation becomes a catalyst for high quality practice within the treatment court, and it promotes broader systems change as outcomes demonstrate effectiveness. 
The Family Treatment Court model promotes an environment where all partners collaborate to continuously improve the Family Treatment Court process and family outcomes. Continuous Quality Improvement, or CQI for short, is a systematic process for monitoring outcomes and improving practice incrementally. The process of CQI requires consistent coordinated communication and information sharing across all of the team members. Barriers to data sharing across agencies need to be discussed by the steering committee and resolved. Leverage your data to be more effective in sharing the story of your family treatment court and making the case for future funding opportunities. In addition to supporting sustainability, these efforts help move family treatments close courts closer to the scale needed to serve all child welfare involved families who may benefit from this intervention. So what comes next for teams now that the Family Treatment Court Best Practice Standards have been released? Take some time to read the standards. The principles reflect what child welfare, court, and treatment professionals have been practicing for many years. Consider how to practice the standards within your community. Share the standards with your stakeholders. A great place to begin is with standard one. It sets a foundation for sustainable practice. Develop a process for self-review. How closely do your practices align with best practices in the field? Family Treatment Court best practice standards are a benchmark for reviewing the quality of operations, program effectiveness, and areas of additional training and technical assistance need. Use the best practice standards to garner resources by demonstrating improved outcomes for child welfare involved families. And lastly, align your local family treatment court with parallel initiatives in the state and community to improve the continuum of services for families. Think about connecting with your court improvement program, community action agencies, school districts, affordable and supportive housing initiatives, local hospitals, and job training programs, just to name a few. Dr. Stein, I'll pass this to you. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Shifton and Brooke, for this really helpful information walking us through these standards. And um, what we want to do now is move into a session for Q&A. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, uh, on the right side of your computer screen, you should see a Q&A portal. Click on that, it will expand, and you'll see a box where you can enter in questions. So um, please uh, enter in as many questions as you would like, um, as uh, this is a great opportunity to uh, really pick the brain of our brains of our speakers and, and get more information that you can apply in your family treatment court. So we do have a couple of questions already, so we'll get started with those. Um, the first person asked, uh, "Do you uh, probably referring to the screening and assessment standard?" Uh, she asked, "Do you have recommendations for which assessment tools to use?" And I'll just let either one of you respond to that one. I can take it since I talked about Standard 4. This is uh, Shirsten Freskin. Um, within Standard 4, there are a, a list of a variety of screening tools that are recommended. So if you kind of dig into that standard, um, those are uh, discussed um, within the rationale and key considerations. All right. Um, um, any other comments you want to add to that, Brooke? No, thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, the next question is, um, is there somewhere in the best practices or other resources that discusses the specific roles of other team members in the FTC other than the judge? Standard, it, it's addressed throughout the standards. So it will talk about uh, some of the key court team members are um, discussed in standard one, but then throughout you will hear a discussion um, about the role of child welfare or treatment providers and uh, other members of the team. It, it's through, woven throughout all of the standards. Okay. So uh, 
we've got a couple of questions about sanctions. Um, so one person asked, uh, what would be considered a sanction for family treatment courts? This is Brooke. I can take that question. Um, so sanctions really end up being one of your last resorts. Um, but sanctions don't look too different than you would see in a, in a traditional treatment court setting in that um, you see ver verbal admonishments used, increased supervision, so you might see a parent coming to court more frequently um, to monitor uh, treatment compliance or um, uh, progress toward in, within their case plan. Um, but really some of the highest magnitude uh, sanctions that we see used really relate to um, um, verbal admonishments coming from some of the other team members based on relationships that they've developed um, in that program. Okay, and um, kind of on the same topic, um, someone sent a question via a chat box and asked, um, I've heard treatment responses and sanctions used interchangeably, but it sounds like you are differentiating between them. What exactly is the difference? That's correct. So um, treatment adjustments are a clinical decision that are made by clinical staff on the team. Sanctions are a response that the team makes um, collaboratively and is based more on whether you're trying to promote a behavior that is supporting family relationships and successful case closure. And, it, and sanctions are going to be decisions that are more targeted toward um, diminishing behaviors that are not supportive of those goals. Shirsten, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, that's, that's exactly right. And I, I, I guess I would say, though, that um, we really encourage teams to, to move away from a binary of I need to give an incentive or a sanction for everything and really move to um, a much more holistic approach to, again, therapeutic responses. That is your goal. Your goal is to um, increase engagement in treatment and in parenting time and, and that whole, all those things that are in the case plan. Um, and, and then to diminish um, or reduce those behaviors that are not supportive of sustained recovery and stable reunification. And so to really think about using that toolbox, um, you, you don't have to issue an incentive or sanction, you just have to respond to all behaviors, those that we like with a, a verbal support and those that, um, or, or other kind of incentive or, or recognition um, and also address other behaviors and, and remembering that you've got that full, that full toolbox of complementary service modifications, treatment adjustments, and incentives and behaviors. Thank you for that. Um, and we've gotten a couple of questions just kind of uh, digging into the roles of various people on the treatment teams um, or the family treatment court teams. Uh, so one person asked, what should be the role of the parent's attorney on the family treatment court team, and how can we better utilize their time within the team? Want me to take that? Um, your parent attorneys are critical. They're critical for, for a variety of reasons. They are um, representing the parent. They are supporting the parent. In many uh, family treatment courts, that parent attorney is really a, a key member of engaging and reaching out to um, the, that parent. So they will, if a parent is maybe coming um, late or uh, is, is not showing up, um, they are, are reaching out to that parent to find out what's going on. I mean, of course, the, their core role is to support due process and those parents' rights within, within the treatment court. So um, they're critical to, to this team and, and the family treatment court. And I'll, I'll also add that um, 
parent attorneys play a, that that critical role in, in discussions about behavior response and how to support engagement. And so that, that's contrary to what we would typically think um, or what we envision sometimes, but they really play an, a very active role in all of the decisions made on behalf of with families. And the other question um, in, regarding folks on the family treatment court team was around peer, peer support and recovery coaches. This person asked, are there best practice standards for recovery coaches, peer support services, and other recovery related individuals that work with our FTC participants? Yeah, this is Brooke. I have not seen a printed um, document of best practice standards for peer support, and I, I may be misspeaking, so Shirsten, please feel free to jump in if, if that's incorrect. However, um, many states have put um, best practices and certification standards in place for peer recovery supports, and so um, there are uh, training modules and expectations for um, for that role that do exist within the field. I just haven't seen anything published as universally as, say, the Family Treatment Court Best Practice Standards. Shirsten, have you run into anything? Um, there are I, there's some materials available through the National Center for um, Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. Um, there are some materials that I know are being worked on. Uh, that will address peer recovery support um, and that the, those various models within treatment courts generally. So some of that material is, I think a lot of that material is emerging, um, which is terrific because as you, as you heard Brooke speak to the research, um, the research is really telling us that this is a, a really critical component to increasing engagement and um, improving outcomes within family treatment courts, but also across other treatment court types. So it's, it's exciting, um, it's exciting stuff. All right, and in, in reference to the research that book covered, um, someone asked just a little bit more detail around some of the data that was presented. She asked, did the data that was collected on moms that was presented, uh, was, it, was it broken down by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status? I have this is I Brooke. read that research. You got it, Brooke. I haven't read it recently. Thanks. Uh, I was just going to say, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I, I can't specifically recall. I can tell you, and I see that there's another question within the chat, that there's questions about um, the research that was cited. It is all provided within the standards themselves, and we certainly could pull specific citations for the, the, the research and data that we shared today. Um, so we could easily go back and look, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, all right. We'll, we'll uh, see if we could perhaps look into that question further. Um, so one person asked a question more about uh, the family involvement. So uh, this person was curious as to how do you involve fathers in the treatment courts? I did see that question Oops. there. Um, <laughs> oh, Shirsten, did you want to jump in? No, I was gonna, I was going to say, why don't you go since you've been in the field most recently? Yeah. So I, there's a couple things that you can that come to mind that you can do to approach father engagement. Um, the first thing that I would suggest is acknowledging the role that fathers have in the family system. Uh, there are some specific treatment and parenting, evidence-based treatment and parenting um, curriculum in the field uh, that you could utilize. Um, I've also seen some teams have some very specific engagement strategies early on. So they use peer recovery supports who are fathers who have been through the child welfare system to actively engage fathers. Um, the other thing that I have seen be effective with teams, and I, I truthfully, I think this happened very organically, um, but I've seen teams who, they have more men and fathers represented early on 
amongst their team members. Think about your teams. I, I, I think back to the team that I was working on. It, it was a lot more women than men. And so thinking about who those fathers engage with, how they can connect, be connected with other professionals, and have interactions with people who have similar experiences to them, meaning they're men, they're fathers, and perhaps they've been through the child welfare system themselves, tends to be some of the most effective approaches for engaging fathers. And truthfully, I, I also, just paying attention yeah. to it, you may notice it. You may yeah. notice more opportunities. Um, one thing that we've heard, a really uh, effective strategy uh, that a number of teams have implemented is to essentially do a walkthrough. Um, so walk through your various systems, walk through child welfare, through the treatment uh, provider um, facilities, through your uh, family treatment court offices, through your courtrooms where, where um, you're holding court. Is it a welcoming place for dads? Do dads see themselves as, um, as as healthy and as excited and wanting to be um, engaged parents and, and effective parents, or are they only seen as an, uh, an opportunity to um, leverage child support? Um, so I, that has been something that I think a lot of the courts that we've worked with have really seen a major change when they do that shift. So in any of those, in any of those, um, populations, you know, what does, what does it look like when you walk through your system? Is it welcoming? Is it engaging? Um, and then to, of course, use gender-specific treatment um, is really critical for not just women, but for men as well. And uh, a lot of the research shows that when we engage dads, um, there are much better outcomes for the, for the family as a whole even if those parents are not ultimately reunified um, with the child or the children, when the dads are engaged in, the, in this process, those children are much more likely to move to a kinship placement. We essentially double our opportunities for kinship. So um, involving dads, we, we expect and want dads involved in our family treatment course. And then just to tie on to that, um, Someone else asked, what about the role of foster parents? And so how do we um, best uh, involve or incorporate them uh, or interact with them during the family treatment court program? Do you want to take the first pass at that, Brooke? Yep. So foster parents, which um, we've seen a, a shift in the field in calling them resource parents so that it's more intuitive how we use them. Um, but foster resource parents are, are a partner throughout the case planning process. Um, it begins by making sure that they really have a clear understanding of what the case plan is, what the treatment, treatment approaches are, and how they can actively engage in, those process, in that process. And then also utilizing those resource parents so that um, that they can help the parent be successful in those interventions. Uh, I always liked to think of resource parents as, um, in some ways, uh, a type of co-parent support. And so looking at are there ways to involve that whole family unit, meaning parent, resource parent, and child, to support that, that child and their relationship with their parent. There's some great research that talks about um, treatment interventions, in-home interventions uh, that are that span between the the foster or the resource parents um, with, when the children are with them, and then span into the home with the with the um, parents, and that that's just a terrific way to really support um, children to feel confident. Um, and to develop uh, great kind of skills amongst the children and the parents to have that um, in-home or parenting intervention that, that spans between the two households. Other great ways to do things that we love are um, a lot of treatment courts will give uh, two books 
um, to the to the parent and the resource parent. So um, in terms of just some maintaining that connection when children are out of the home, but there's a set time that the parent um, will call to check in with the kids and um, will maybe read the book. So the, the resource or the foster parents are sitting with the children or the children themselves are, are turning the pages of the book as the parent is is reading the book over the phone and they're turning the pages of the book um, where they are. So that's just a really neat way to maintain connection between the families. Thank you for that. And the next question shifts a little bit. Um, they were more interested in some information around funding. So they asked, um, are there best practices around funding uh, and, and, you know, the types of sources of funding, is there any um, concern about seeking financial support from third party grant makers? I'll, I'll try to tackle this one and then jump in, Brooke. Um, okay. So the, the, first, the first thing we would say about funding is that um, you need to be accessing the services and supports that already exist in your community. Um, Family treatment courts, treatment courts do not, uh, do not manufacture um, cases. These cases exist in our communities already. And so what we really need to do is look around our communities and um, figure out who is already funded to provide the services and supports that you need. Um, and, and our job within the treatment court team is to, is to develop really strong, individualized, strength-based, comprehensive case plans, and then to, to access uh, the, the community-based services to braid together funding streams if, there, if that's necessary, that we're going to access Medicaid, we're going to access um, any other kind of um, focused treatment funding, uh, community, you know, county or city funding, um, specialized programs, whatever that is, to have this sort of seamless um, delivery of services for families. So that, that's the first thing I would say about funding. Um, second, I would say as you are developing those case plans and determining what families need, if you, if you see gaps in services or if you are under-resourced in particular areas, that's where you're really working within the governance structure. So you've got your core team, then you've got a steering committee that is uh, composed of essentially the supervisors for the, that, those frontline staff, and maybe it's in some cases there's some overlap there. And then you've got an executive level committee, and those three levels of governance work together to address um, practice barriers and resource um, needs. So it's really important, and, and we work across the country and see lots of folks who want to skip really paying attention to that governance structure, but that particularly that executive level advisory committee are the, the, the CEOs, the county commissioners, the city um, representatives who can help you, for instance, um, look at affordable housing opportunities in your, in your community and develop affordable housing that you need, or can look to uh, build out a particular um, treatment. So if you're working with your treatment providers, um, you may see that you have a lot of families in a particular part of your community, but there's no treatment there. That's where you want to work with your treatment providers, maybe your city or county government, to establish a treatment facility in areas where, where the families uh, live that you're serving. Um, so we want to always access those things. And grant funding is really, it, it, it's a tiny, tiny piece of what we need to be using to fund um, our services and supports for families. We really need to be working within the, the resources that schools and housing authorities already have in place and, and um, county and city governments already have in place for families. Brooke, do you want to jump in some more? 
I don't have a whole lot to add other than just to, to clearly answer your question. As a collaborative, it's okay to seek out additional funding if you decide there's a gap and there's a need and it doesn't already exist within the community. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and again, thank you both for your presentations today and um, sharing so much of your expertise and experience with us. Um, there were a couple of you who asked for some uh, the slides. So yes, if you registered for our webinar, you will receive um, the slides from today's presentation. And uh, we also will look into um, a, a list of sources um, as there as one of our presenters or participants pointed out, there were a number of uh, uh, sources cited throughout. So we'll try to see if we can get a list of that to share with you all as well. Um, and again, if you haven't downloaded the publication yet, here uh, is the link to the Children and Family Futures Organization's website. And uh, there is um, a place where you can access that publication and download it directly to your computer. And we also have a, as promised, the Certificate of Attendance you should have just seen a file transfer box pop up on your computer. And uh, in a moment, a file will come up there that will allow you to download the certificate of attendance. So you should uh, see now a file name, webinar attendance. Click on that. The download button should have will turn to a darker shade of gray once you click on the file name. And uh, then you can click download to save that document directly to your computer. We also have a couple of polls that have just popped up. So uh, as, as you're downloading the file, um, we also encourage you to respond to our poll to provide more information to us as well as to SAMHSA regarding um, more information or technical assistance that you believe would be helpful around this topic. Also, if you've not signed up for the Gain Center's listserv yet, we send out a monthly e-newsletter and uh, we share about uh, family treatment courts sometimes. We share about various types of programs across the nation, recent research, recent grant opportunities, and more uh, through our monthly e-newsletter. We also uh, share information about events coming out of the Gain Center. So please do sign up for our newsletters if you haven't done so already. And finally, um, if you would like to reach out to us directly, here is our information. Um, first on top is the information to contact SAMHSA. But then if you want to reach out to us here at the Gain Center, here's our website as well as our toll-free number. We do receive funds to provide phone-based technical assistance to communities across the country to help you um, work on issues in uh, uh, trying to divert people with mental illness or substance use disorders from your justice system and, and move them into treatment and services. So don't hesitate to reach out to us if you would like to have a conversation or receive phone-based TA regarding an issue that you're facing. So again, thank you so much to our presenters for uh, their, their work with us today. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us. And we uh, look forward to having you join us in the new calendar year. Uh, we will be announcing our next webinar soon to take place in January. So be on the lookout for that, and we hope to see you then. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.